First one's a no-show, and I'm like, I'm like, oh sh, this is going down fast. Okay, Epstein. And that's the worst call as a business owner when you get somebody. You're, you're like happy, go like, hey, Mark, what's up? Your shit sucks. It's like, oh, don't like that, you know. So there's a lot of excuses mm -hmm. from call centers why quality of leads are so bad. What happens is when things are easy, people get comfortable. I have yet met one company who rely on telemarketing leads exclusively. What's happened with the leads when they were coming easy, they got lazy and they got simple. So they're sitting there going like, well, Dimitri, I'll get sales, but where are my leads? I've tried five telemarketing uh, services, didn't work. I am next to you on airplane. So I don't know who you are. We just sat next to each other. Uh, what do you do for a living? Um, I help businesses handle their back office uh, problems, their administrative tasks. I manage and run their companies from a in the office aspect. In what niche? I'm in the niche market of uh, contractors, roofers, especially in the insurance industry, roofing sales. Man, you're so boring. I, 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 I want a different seat. I don't want to sit next to this guy. That's how you introduce yourself? No. Usually I'll say I run, I run a team of about 30, uh, 30, age, 30 girls that work with me uh, to help businesses grow that are based in the U.S. I happen to live in Mexico, so all my Do you team... run any boys? There's some programmers. There's a couple boys. <laughs> uh, 30 girls. I run a team of 30 girls. Yeah, 30 girls. It's okay, Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> They're all over 18. <laughs> I don't... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, and then we uh, we help businesses grow, and we help them, um, you know, manage their day to day, the minuscule stuff that people don't want to do. And virtual agents are out there. We are a virtual agent in a way, but what's not out there is specialists within an industry. Normally, you hire somebody in the Philippines, and they're helping a denti dental practice out, and then they're helping a contractor out. There's no knowledge of the industry. Me having been from the industry, it gives me an in depth knowledge of kind of how to help other people that are in like situations. How big is that niche, virtual assistant niche? How is it grown market? The virtual assistant niche in itself, uh, not not the roofing side, is very large. It's a lot of outsourcing is happening out there. I mean, that's become you know bridging borders. People in Philippines work in here. People in India, Pakistan, Mexico, Dominican. Everybody's looking to work. So, and the sad thing is, millennials here aren't looking to work so hard. So it's become a bigger uh, factor for a lot of people. How come Indian moves to Mexico? To it's open a, great, a business? It's a, it's a great question. Um, I always quote the song from Rascal Flatts. It's called uh, Bust a Broken Road. And I'm very similar like that. I don't know. Like, I just take turns as they come. You know, so these turns have led me in one fashion or another to get there. Um, at that point, of course, I was operating the call center. And I made my way there. And next thing you know, six years later, here I am living there. Okay. Let's talk about call centers since you mentioned it. You sure. sold the call center. Yep. How long have you been in the call center business? 12, Telemarketing. Twelve years I operated a call center. Twelve, 12 years. years. Yeah. I was one of your clients. For the yep. record, we'll yep. talk about it. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about business of call center. Uh, mm -hmm. How profitable is it? What's the profit margins? I know in the roofing, net 10%. You know, I would never do a business where you're not making 35%, right? Gross yeah, or 35%, net? 35% uh, gross. Net is a factor of based on where you are with overhead and things. Yes. Um, so, you know, if you're not doing a 15 to 20% on that side, you're pretty good. 15, 20. So similar to roofing on a growth, but more on the net. Yeah, more on the net, I would say so. Because there's not as much overhead of trucks and gas and office expenses as much as you would have on the, uh, on the call center side compared to roofing. Why did you get out of business? Why did you decide to sell? I saw the industry changing, and um, I, saw, I noticed two big factors. One was uh, a lot of people entering the market, and this was due to the lack of barriers, uh, the barriers of entry. Just like an unlicensed state versus a licensed state, you're going to have more contractors. Um, the regulations for getting data and things like that came down. Um, so a lot of companies got in. The fact of having your own dialer came down, your own software came down. Um, so a lot of people entering the market. Also, saturation of people now understanding. It used to be the magic bullet. People had the call center, and they're like, oh, I got a guy. It's great. I have a call center, and I make all the roofing sales in the world. They tell their friend who told their friend, and now it became something where everyone wants a lead. And um, there's just too, many, too much demand. And at the end of the day, there's only the same number of consumers. The demand of the contractor has gone up, but the consumers are still the same number. But why did you sell? And did you do well for yourself? 
Um, I did. Uh, unfortunately, the center that bought it, um, truth be told, they are uh, failing and running behind uh, and keeping up and paying. So that's something that I'm dealing with. Uh, but that said... Paying you or paying... Paying me. Um, but that said, I'm actually happy I got out of it. And I'll tell you what was happening. Uh, six years in Mexico when I went there, um, the business escalated monumentally. We grew a huge amount. I reinvested a lot of the capital into software. Um, I've always been one of those people that likes to create efficiencies and less management. Uh, as I was doing that, I noticed that um, things were starting to change. The greed factor of the agents was going up. Um, the competition was growing, more people entering the market. A lot of people not following the rules that you should to keep it where when I call you at home that you, you know, you don't cuss me out. Uh, well, always there's somebody in town market that's going to cuss you out, but meaning like got lower percentage. The rules weren't being followed. Uh, people were starting to steal from each other. Uh, data was being stolen. And this happened from the top down. It's not a blame on a, the agent or a blame on the business owner or a blame on the contractor. It happened from all aspects. Owners got greedy. They wanted to get more money and deliver less. Um, contractors got greedy. They wanted to hire you and you and you. Um, or they would hire, like, I was more expensive. They would hire the cheaper guy in the initial part because they can get more leads quicker because they were like, hey, it's a brand new storm. I can use a cheaper guy. But then when things got hard, they went to the more reputable guy because they knew he would continue delivering longer. Um, so there wasn't that partnership that used to exist. You know, before there was a partnership. I work with you, you work with me. It became more like, hey, let's all, you know, try to get something for each other, like just for myself, selfishness. And the agents, same thing trickled down to the agents. The agents started being selfish. You started seeing people take leads from one company and sell them to another company because they had a buddy at the neighboring call center. Um, and that was becoming more and more rampant. And I know nowadays it's very high up there. So I've seen price. Uh, point uh, per lead, telemarketing lead went way up. Mm -hmm. um, I remember prices being as low as $50. Now I see up to $200. Mm -hmm. But the quality at the same time goes way down. Yeah. And there's a lot of drama too behind the scenes. So there's a lot of excuses mm -hmm. from call centers why quality leads are so bad. Yep. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, in my network, and I talk to at least 200 contractors every month, yep. I have yet met one company who rely on telemarketing leads exclusively. Right. Like I've no companies in the past. And l right. uh, let's talk about history of construction and storm chasing uh, together and yep. also uh, how call centers came about. So back in the day, you had companies who, you know, up to half a billion, so build massive corporations based on call center, right? Yep. So now, you have companies who still, I don't want to say rely, use them, mm -hmm. but rarely happy. And I'm talking about big companies, like yeah. 15, 20 million dollar companies. I do three, four company tours per month. Yep. I just came from Rapid Roofing, I came from Advantix. Yep. So now, like Advantix Roofing, you know, 3.5 million dollar company, brand new, try five call centers, typical story that I hear. Facebook works, it's number one lead gen. I've tried five telemarketing, uh, services didn't work. Why it's not working for little guys, for new guys, why it's not? So here's the thing, there's a couple of factors to this. There's not one answer where I could say, oh, they just want to help. It's not the truth. Uh, the contract was wrong. It's not the truth. There's a combination. There's a series of issues and concerns that can make it work. Number one, like you said, this company, and you met with them, and they, you said they're new. They've went with five different Four companies. Four years. Four years, okay. Four years is a decent time. Mm -hmm. But they went with five different companies. The lack of commitment from the contractor to the telemarketing center and backwards, both, has failed. The contractor is stuck looking for someone to help him today. The telemarketer is also stuck saying, hey, I just hired 20 people and you don't want leads anymore, but I need to fill them, so I need to find your competition and sell to him. So there's a lack of commitment. So what happens now is I'm going out selling and maybe you were willing to buy 100 leads, which is what I was happy delivering, but now I find five guys that can do 20. Start selling to five of them. Now those five guys, some of them grow. All of a sudden they want 40, they want 60, they want 100. Now I'm in the, in the uh, widget business. I'm not in a service business. I'm more in a production business. I just want to produce and satisfy you. Like here's a lead. 
So the commitments failed from both sides. The call centers haven't committed to their people, and we, we're a prime example of this. I'm not picking on anyone. Look, I, I don't want to make it look like this sure, is sure. an attack on call centers. I was a call center. I understand their problems very much. They face a very difficult situation because if you have 20 employees sitting in your office and you don't make revenues this week, you don't have an office next week. You have to make revenues, which means sometimes you have to oversell. It's the truth. It's what happens sometimes in life. So they oversell and they hope to deliver. But then what happens is a contractor comes up and you're thinking, oh, you know, Dimitri's buying leads from me. We have that market filled. We don't need anyone else. And Dimitri goes, oh, by the way, I only accept appointments on Wednesday and you have to set them three days earlier and I'm gonna call to verify them. And all of a sudden I'm thinking he just bought 100 but now this guy's gonna take 100 weeks for me to give him 100 appointments. I need to go find another guy, you know? And the commitment from both sides has failed. The larger companies, sometimes they don't um, hold their agents accountable. Um, so company standpoint, what would I do different? Company standpoint, um, pick your best guys that understand appointments, that are willing to do it, put them in communication with the people making the leads and have them work together. Even if you have 50 agents, you don't give your leads to 50 people. You give them to two or three to get a good test. Like whenever you do a hypothesis, what do you do? You change one element. You don't change all the elements. Mm -hmm. By having 50 agents run it, you're basically not giving the call center a fair shot or yourself a fair shot in knowing if that's a call center that you should work with. So a lot of guys, they put them out there like, oh, we bought them and it's not a big deal, especially if they're buying for 50, 60. That's why some of the guys have raised the price. They were saying, hey, look, I'm gonna raise the price. I want you to hold more value with this. You're, you're about to spend 200 bucks. Put your best guy out there and see if it works. Don't just spend it on anybody. What do people do? I have a new rookie. I'm gonna give him appointments. And they put them out there. I've had this in the past. I had um, Toucan Roofing down in uh, Texas, a good guy. Uh, Mark, I love the man. Um, good customer. He would um, run my, our leads and he loved it and swore by them. I consulted him for a little bit, uh, one period, a few years back, and he started doing great with them. They grew their business quite a bit because of us. Now, that said, fast forward a few years, calls me up and respectful elderly man, always like, sir, your leads have gone to hell. And I'm like, uh, that's the worst call as a business owner when you get somebody, you're, you're like happy, go like, hey Mark, what's up? Your shit sucks. It's like, oh, I don't like that, you know? So I'm like, what's going on? So he tells me and I look through and I'm trying to be unbiased and I'm like, okay, let's do, let's do one thing. There's four appointments on the board for tomorrow morning. Would you do me a favor and run those appointments? Can the old man still sell? So I kind of like guilt him a little. He's like, of course I can sell. I go, well, can you get out there? Because in my mind, I started thinking new agents, nobody I knew. I wanted to see what happens. First appointment, 9 a.m., I got a phone call at about 9.05. Sir, first one's a no-show. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, shit, this is going down fast. And I go, I'm like, well, run the other ones. We know how this goes, so let's just see what happens. I don't hear from him until 6 p.m. I got a phone call, it says, Sir, there's no problem with your appointments. We're good. I actually sold the first one they called back to. I'm going to have a talk with my team. So what happens is when people are given leads, they take, they take them for granted. And you have to create value. And how you do that is different. Some people charge for their appointments. Some people take a percentage. Um, some people will only deliver if you get And I don't care if the leads from Facebook or from uh, anything. What happens is when things are easy, people get comfortable. There's a, I used to call with my sales reps a belly full attitude. When they hit a certain number, they don't want to work anymore. Mm -hmm. So you got to keep them a little hungry in some fashion, tie them together. So from the contractor side, that's one issue. If you take it from the telemarketing center side, same thing, commitment. We need to commit more to certain companies, but we need to also set a standard between each other. Like for example, if you know your budget, you have 20 people, you have this, you have to say, hey, Dimitri, look, you're going to have to accept 25 appointments a week from me because for me to be a partner with you, that's a minimum for me to commit to you and I'll commit to you. You know, we commit both ways. But they don't do that. They let the rules kind of go whichever way. Whatever you want. Oh, you want two a week. Okay, great. Two a week is great. Fresh storm. You gave me uh, $10,000. I'm happy. I got 10000 of your dollars. You want two a week. I can probably give you all your appointments tomorrow because it's a fresh storm. But you want to get two a week. In week 50, I'm going to barely be able to make an appointment. It's a 50-week-old but, storm. But why is that? That's my biggest problem with the telemarketing services. You guys all can produce uh, fresh, mm -hmm. but guess what? Everybody can produce, like Facebook can produce. Yeah. Organic, everything is spiked. Like I always tell guys, and guys, if you're watching this, if you need leads right after the storm, you suck, you should not be in business. Mm -hmm. And th 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 that's the reality. Like if storm comes 
And in your own town, you have you should have network, friends, family, referrals from the past, client. Like, why do you need leads? And what I mean need leads is leads to survive. Yep. Why are you stressing out? You know, if you have, you can get leads anywhere right after right. the store. That's my problem with the call centers, the biggest problem, because everybody can deliver right after the storm. Mm -hmm. I don't need the leads after the storm. I need leads down the road. So for me, telemarketing is marketing. But right? how long have you been in business? Five years. Five years. Six and you've years. established a database of clients, you've established a presence, you've established a system. Now take somebody who's either new or has taken over a business, like you step out and someone's sure. taking over and they're trying to do what you've done. And they're not sure. And meanwhile, while they learn this formula, they still need to eat. Telemarketing is a great solution. Telemarketing works when it's run properly. It can't become your whole. It has to be portion of your marketing. Sure. And um, but, then, see, but see, the, the problem with that too is this is, uh, th there's also a promise problem. Mm -hmm. So when telemarketing calls you to sell, how do you guys, what's the sales pitch? Are you ready to take more appointments like right now? And um, it's almost like drug deal. Mm -hmm. Like you want to, they want to this pill, they want to feel good right now. Yeah. And if you take that pill, you feel good now, but tomorrow you're hurting. Mm -hmm. Just like if you go to the gym, don't use, you know, steroids. Like if you want to grow your muscles, you know, it's hard work, but it will right. work. I mean, if you're going to start injecting today, it'll grow today, but two weeks later, you're not fixing anything. Right. You know, you still have to work hard. No, you do have to work hard, but the problem is like people became good with the low hanging fruit. So this is what happened. The sales quality also went down. Forget the phone part. Let's say I get you those 100 appointments. When they come easy, what happened now is people just went for the low hanging fruit. The follow up fails, and we know this in all leads, like in any industry, follow up is a very poor thing for salesmen. Because why? Salesmen are about today, they're about now. What's going on right now? What's in my peripheral? That's all I'm worried about. I'm not worried what's behind me because we keep moving forward. That's how salespeople are built. It's a gift, but they need to have partner up with someone to help them with the behind them, right? But what's happened with the leads when they were coming easy, they got lazy and they got simple. So they're sitting there going like, well, Dimitri, I'll get sales, but where are my leads? So they're not real salesmen, they're not networkers, they're not creating new avenues of approach, they're not trying to you know, talk to their friends, talk to their neighbors, go sit at a local tavern and say, work something out with someone there and say, hey, if you refer me business, I'll refer you business. And you know those type of things, you don't see them as much. They've gotten lazy, they want you to spoon feed them. Like give me business and I'll bring you a contract and you pay me. Like it, there's like no initial effort from these people to do it. And this carries down to the call center too. The guys are like, well, we used to call and, you know, like I'll tell you the real numbers because one thing about me, I've always built systems and so we track a lot of numbers. Sure. Unlike a lot of people you're going to find and it's just because I've been numbers investing in lie. software. Back when, when a storm would happen, the percentage, what would you get this, the percentage? If I call 100 people, I actually say hello. So forget the people that don't answer or answer machines. If you say hello, what percentage of appointments would I get in a fresh storm of those 100 people? When? A fresh storm happened two days ago. 40. Okay. Three. Three percent. Out of 100. Out of 100. So you have to call 100 people to get three right. answers. So pick a storm that you know that recently, like okay. how many people. H how long will it take you to, to make 100 calls or to dial 100 calls? It, depending on your system and the number of people you have. So for us, I mean, we did 100,000 phone calls a day. So, but we had. 100,000? 100,000. 100,000, 150,000 a day. So 3,000 people would answer phone calls. Yes, hypothetically, but that's the phone calls. Remember, there's also a percentage I didn't tell you about, like how many people just are bad numbers, not connecting, answering machines, etc. Sure. So it's less than that. But when you get that percentage that does answer, those 3,000 or whatever, you're going to get 3% of those people. Now, of those people, you have to then say, do you even qualify? You know, are you in the right area? Are you the owner or not a renter? Are you willing to meet me after five o'clock? So this is the other part that I, I love this. This is something that every contractor, if you're working with a call center, this is a 101 tip that they should take, which is you don't get to work nine to five. Your client works nine to five. You get to work outside their hours. They're not waiting there to, oh, my roofer's coming, I have to skip work. No, they're gonna see you after work. But what we would have is people say, oh, I only work nine to five. So we are on the schedule, finally got Dimitri ready to say yes. And he's like, wants an appointment. And I'm like, great, I'm about to get an appointment. And I say, okay, would six o'clock work? And you're like, or would five o'clock work? And you're like, no, I get home at five, six. Oh, my guy doesn't work at six. And you're like, well, that's okay. You know what? I'm not really not even sold on this. Forget it. And you know, the, the, the immediate so what, thing the is keep? gone. 
The tip is extend your hours and work outside of the normal hours that your client does. You can't expect them today when they don't know you to have value in you yet. You have to establish value, which means you have to work around them. If they can meet you at seven, you're gonna have to meet them at seven. I'm sorry about traffic, but that's what you're gonna have to do. Um, you're a salesperson, you have to accommodate them right now. When you build value, then you could say, I'm gonna meet you at 12.31, you know, and be more picky, but you can't sure. do that in the beginning. Um, so this would happen, and you'd see these call center guys um, with that being one restriction, or, oh, I need it 24 hours out, I need it 48 hours out, I need it 72 hours out. There's also another number I could tell you. Any appointment made within the next 24 hours, it holds at a higher percentage, it holds at 85% versus one day more. One day more falls down to 70%. Anything beyond that, I wouldn't even make them because I knew you were gonna call me and say, this guy's not home. Like, it just was forgotten, you know? Sure. And, and it's just what happens. Um, so there's a little bit of learning to play with each other. You know, like, hey, we know what we're doing, you know what you're doing, and we need to play together right. It's why my original clients, the ones that I worked and grew those 12 years with, it's why those guys typically did better with leads. They had an understanding, because, and it's our, my fault, I'll, I'll say it, and this is true for other call centers. We had to establish that level of communication of the rules. Like, hey, Dimitri, I'll give you appointments, but here's the rules, are you good, you know? When we were smaller, you got more attention from me. I made sure you understood the rules. When you were larger, or I have a bunch of demand and everybody's asking me for a lead, Hey, Dimitri, I, I, it's not that I don't care, it's just I have to take the next call, you know, and I'm, I'm going to sales guide to sales guide. Everyone in Dallas wants me. Um, so you don't get that attention where you say, hey, here's what you're going to do. Here's what you're, you have to do. Um, so there's a little bit of that that's also failed in the industry now. Hey, everybody. Boss up. Subscribe and like. Give us a thumbs up if you like this video for more content just like this.